This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big issue shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. It's always bewildered me how fast progress can be. It took us 1900 years to go from bronze to iron, but only 66 short years to go from man's first flight to man walking on the moon. And as much as we may think the pace has slowed down, it has done the opposite. Everything with our technology is getting faster, more accurate, and cheaper, and nowhere is this more evident than in space. With every space technology, there was a military purpose originally behind it. The rockets that we built to travel to the moon were originally made to carry world-ending warheads. GPS was originally used to track submarines and hunt them down, but now it helps me find the nearest convenience store at 2am. So if we're seeing all of this progress, like imaging and satellite communications, how much progress has the government made in the field of space warfare? The answer is a lot, and all sides are now playing a game with even higher stakes. With nuclear weapons, kinetic missiles, kamikaze satellites and EMPs all up there, space has become more militarized than ever before, with more players involved than ever before. But to take us through the most complicated of the 21st century battlefields, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. The Next Pearl Harbor So space has always been militarized. Many officials and practitioners or um, government people today talk about the militarization of space as if it's something that's new. It's very, very old. It's as old as the space age itself. If it wasn't for the military and intelligence uses of satellites and uh, using rockets to deliver nuclear weapons, we would not have had the space age that we have for the past 70 years or so. Bledon Bowen is a professor of international relations at the University of Leicester and the author of War in Space, Strategy, Space Power, and Geopolitics. He's worked with everyone from the UK Defence Department to NATO to the US State Department. And he joins us today. In, in, mo in most ways, there are just more countries now doing what the Soviet Union and the United States did first uh, throughout the 60s, the 70s, uh, and, and the 1980s. And from the specifically military perspective, Everyone is trying to catch up to what the United States has led the way with in terms of using satellites and space infrastructure for tactical battlefield applications. So precision bombing, uh, networked computer systems being able to communicate on the battlefield, um, the increasing use of drones that use all kinds of satellite networks and, and communications links to function. Um, Space-based intelligence, not just for national intelligence or nuclear um, proliferation monitoring, but for more tactical and operational timely and more sensitive uh, capabilities there. So that would be sort of how I'd sum up what's happening in military space. Everyone is trying to catch up to the Americans and the Russians are trying to resuscitate what they left off with in the 1980s because of the collapse in the 1990s, of course. They're now reconstituting old technologies and trying to recover some ground there. So to stay on that subject, where are the Russians at the moment on this? Are they ahead or behind where they left off at the end of the Soviet Union? Um, good question. I, th I think it depends um, in, in what specific areas of military space technologies uh, you're talking about. Um, but I think in terms of satellite navigation, um, precision weapons, um, from my understanding um, of, of, um, of Russian military space, Space, they are ahead of where they were in the late 80s and we've seen the Russian military forces practice um, conventional precision warfare in Syria in ways that we didn't necessarily see in, in the 1980s uh, with, the, with the Red Army. Um, although uh, the naval question might be a bit more tricky. Um, I'm not sure if the Russian Navy today is as good as it was with space support back in the late 1980s, uh, back in the, in the, in the Gorshkov uh, era. Um, so this is one of the complicating factors with space in that 
you can't just talk about space or military space in general. You have to start boiling down into very specific areas of satellites and technologies and, and, and services as well. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed bag, but generally speaking, the Americans still have quantity and quality in most forms of space technologies and assets. And is that gap between the Americans and the Chinese and Russians widening or are Beijing and Moscow catching up here? I, th I think it's fair to say that the Chinese are definitely catching up quicker than perhaps what the Americans are pulling away with. Um, I mean, the Americans, are, you know, they, they have military space systems that are many generations in right now. Um, and they're quite well developed and well networked as well. Uh, the, the 1991 Gulf War for the United States was really formative, not in terms of demonstrating the battlefield use of space systems, but in showing how badly organised the infrastructure was in getting the right data and the right space services to the right people and getting the right people in the various organizations and agencies to do with space systems and space support to talk to each other and, and share the right information. And the Americans have been perfecting and improving that for the past uh, 30 years or so. China today really is, um, I mean, they've been launching a lot of satellites as any look at um, uh, launch statistics uh, will tell you. And they are running really to try and catch up in terms of the number of assets. And they are very firmly number two now in terms of the number of satellites that are in Earth orbit that are registered to um, the Chinese state or companies uh, or ch Chinese companies. So they are catching up but a lot of their new technology is of course first generation for them um, they've probably been learning um, from American experiences in whatever information they've been able to get their hands on um, or just learning from what's published in open source uh, materials as well um, but it's a learning curve for them as well so they're getting the technology up but it's first generation um, and it's following you know 40 years of high technology investments in the Chinese um, sort of high technology defense sectors as well, which really took off, um, you know, in, in the mid 1990s, especially after the uh, the Taiwan crisis of 1996. A lot of weapons in space have been looked at as having the potential as a first strike weapon. How could they be used in this capacity? Um, so I, I write about um, the um, space Pearl Harbor uh, scenario um, in, in my book, actually, in, in, in War in Space, uh, which came out last year. And even though they do have some potential as a first strike weapon, they could always not be used in a first strike capacity. They can be motives for withholding um, attacks on space systems. Uh, whether in space or on the ground, so attacking satellite ground stations, for example, they can be held in reserve until a later point in the campaign, uh, a more sensitive um, time of uh, terrestrial operations has happened, rather than doing a massive all-out strike. Um, so th there are still lots of questions uh, really around what on Earth is a space Pearl Harbor and what does actually look like. Um, there's a lot of satellites that the Americans have in space, lots of different systems, and in terms of how bad um, an episode of space warfare could be, it very much depends on what is struck, when, and how much is destroyed, and how much of the actions are going to generate a large cloud of debris that would then threaten other satellites. And not all important satellites share the same kind of flight paths and uh, orbital altitudes as well. So there's a lot of variables that come into play here. So um, in, in good academic fashion, um, it depends is the answer to that question. Um, now, the GPS is, of course, something that a lot of people latch onto, and, and it's one of the most familiar satellite systems uh, that, that we have. We all use it uh, every day in our smartphones and countless other um, infrastructure applications like in the financial systems and, and logistics. So if it all went dark, if it all went quiet, whether it's because the Chinese have launched you know, 60 odd kinetic interceptor missiles to take them all out and blow them all up all at the same time, which would be quite a remarkable feat and very difficult to do. Or they managed to you know, infiltrate uh, the computer systems of the virus and they just, it just switches off, you know, pull the plug. Um, you know, that would be a very, very bad day for the US military if it all goes off. Now, the feasibility of that is another question. So we have to bear in mind that that's not necessarily an easy thing to pull off. Now, no doubt the Americans 
do have plans to mitigate this. They, they know that GPS is definitely a worthy target if you're fighting the US military. But even in the system designs of GPS, there was extensive work being carried out to make it harder to um, jam the communications for military uses of GPS, but also to harden cybersecurity issues in later years uh, as well. Now, in terms of the civilian uses, there might actually uh, be more alternatives for the civilian user. So for if you just want to get sat nav in your car um, and drive somewhere or um, shipping industry might still need it for autonomous docking at ports or precise docking. Um, there are other systems to GPS now available or just coming online now. So there's Galileo, the European equivalent. There's the Chinese one, Beidou, and the Russian GLONASS. And um, more and more civilian chipsets for navigation packages are communicating with two or more of those navigation systems at all times. And in terms of the financial system that relies on GPS, if they haven't already started um, putting together alternatives for timekeeping because um, financial transactions require a universal time, which is currently provided and verified by um, the atomic clocks on the GPS constellation. If they don't have a good alternative for that, then we are asking for trouble because the threat to GPS is not just human made. Um, there could be a massive solar storm which, would, which could wreak havoc with all sorts of satellites. Um, so we would need alternatives even, even on, on sort of environmental grounds, um, really. So there can be mitigations in place for wider civilian uses of navigation satellites, especially when more of these systems are, are coming online for the civilian economy to use. One of the big recent developments in this field was the creation of a dedicated space force by the Trump administration. Has this had much of an impact on this field though? Yeah, so yeah, it was very interesting uh, to see, um, you know, Donald Trump jump on this when it happened oh, back in it was 2018, I think, when when I when it was first sort of jumped on by the Trump administration, and what this has amounted to so far, really, is you know rearranging the deck chairs, um, uh, you know, in 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 the in the Pentagon, really, um, you know, the Space Force is not really doing anything substantively new. It's really it's changing the uniforms of the people who are formerly in the US Air Force uh, who are who are doing um you know who are operating the United States military space infrastructure so in terms of capabilities there's nothing massively new here the space force is continuing the work of uh, what was once the major part of the US Air Force. Now, they're still part of the Department of the Air Force. They are semi-autonomous, a bit like the Marine Corps is uh, with the US Navy. So uh, what would be interesting to see in the years to come is what new culture might develop um, with the Space Force, because uh, the Space Force, also the, the US Air Force's space components um, were always fighting air-mindedness, as they, they called it um, in, 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 the, in, the, in the Air Force. Now they don't really have that internal fight, but that fight is now external, but happening at the same time as the other US services for resources as well. So it'll be interesting to see what sort of decisions might come out as a result of that change in culture. Will the space pathway in the, in the Department of Defense be more prestigious and recognized as a result, um, perhaps? Also, there is a potential for changes in acquisitions. So how does the Pentagon actually um, acquire new technologies or new systems in, in military space. And changing the departments might change the relationships between lobbyists in Congress um, and the military industrial complex and the companies and the contractors that actually get the government money to build um, you know, weapons and equipment and, and, and computers for, for the military. So that might change, although I'm not seeing many indications that there has been a revolution on the equipment acquisitions front, but that could be another potential area for change. A lot of the talk around this subject, even going back to the 1980s, was around using lasers to either push enemy satellites off course or help clean up some of the thousands of bits of debris up there by bringing them back down to Earth. How significant do you think lasers will be to this theatre going forward? That's a good question. Um, uh, it was a concept that I um, researched a bit in terms of the sort of political and strategic 
possibilities and consequences of it in, in my very first academic article, actually. Uh, this was back in 2014, and it was uh, based on a master's dissertation I wrote about the politics of um, uh, space debris removal or active debris removal, ADR, um, to give it its proper term. And that was one of the um, sort of methods of ADR uh, uh, I looked at. And, and that's for very low orbiting satellites. That, and, and the idea is, is that you fire a, a laser of some kind that might have an ablative effect or a slowing down effect on the object, not necessarily satellite, but any object, and just increase the resistance on it to then slow it down more and bring it down sooner than it otherwise would. Um, and yeah, as, as a concept, I mean, it's a, it's a matter of focus and power to make it hot enough to start physically damaging uh, a satellite rather than slightly nudging its orbit. Because uh, if you're targeting an active satellite, then if you alter its course even by a little bit, which is really what these original debris removal concepts talking about, that satellite will be able to course correct uh, by a nudge from its own, own maneuvering thrusters. Um, uh, so, so I'm skeptical as to whether that really has weapons potential, but um, we know that um, there, there are some instances of lasers being used to dazzle the optics of spy satellites, for example. So it's not, um, you know, to, to zap and blow up a satellite, but it's to interfere uh, with the optics, it, you know, in the same way that um, um, some, some idiots point uh, lasers into pilots' la 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 landing aircraft. Um, it's just to temporarily dazzle and um, uh, just make things harder to see over a target area on the ground. So, so that really is where lasers are most most useful at the moment in terms of what we could call space warfare, or um, if it's not something that is that causes permanent damage, then it could just be part of the cat and mouse game of intelligence agencies. So, there is always potential for lasers to improve, but um, it's a matter of efficiency and focusing as well, especially if you've got ground-based lasers which have to fight through the atmosphere which distorts lasers. The problem with space-based lasers is that you need to have a power plant on the, the laser emitter in orbit and it's still you know despite the remarkable advances in reusable rocket technology with SpaceX um, it's still very expensive to put things in space and also when you put weapons in space you can't really maintain them um, you, you can't really easily send people or machines to inspect them easily or cheaply like you could with something based on the ground so if you can't maintain them that often um, it, it raises questions as to whether something has been deployed for 10 years and you want to fire the weapon, how confident are you it's going to work tomorrow? Um, so there, there are questions that with logistical, logistical concerns uh, in, in space. But um, until lasers become extremely efficient and easy to focus, we're not really in, 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 the, in, in a Buck Rogers or Moonraker scenario just yet, which is just as well if you don't like Roger Moore. So the gauntlet has been thrown down, and much like the first planes being used for simply scouting missions during the First World War, additional weaponization is now on the cards. Could satellites become the new Heinkel bombers? Could this technology that allows us to use our phones and GPS and banks be the newest theater of war? Well, for that, we turn to our second guest. Part 2. Nowhere Left to Hide well, I would probably say that uh, the massive change occurred since uh, the launch of, of the Sputnik by the Soviets in 1957. And, and uh, since then, the, the, the major space powers achieved uh, a massive qualitative leap from uh, simply going into space and, and exploring uh, its capabilities to starting really exploiting it and, and making uh, the, the operations of the modern military, as well as the future military, largely dependent on space-based assets. Uh, and we can speak more about um, the particulars uh, later on, but, but those dependencies range from uh, intelligence gathering, reconnaissance uh, and targeting to um, strategic communications and um, uh, to um, 
uh, potential deployment of um, offensive capabilities in space, something that certainly was entertained a lot uh, in the second stages of the Cold War. Alexei Muravyov is the Associate Professor of National Security and Strategic Studies at Curtin University, as well as the Director of the Strategic Flashlight Forum. He specializes in issues surrounding orbital weapons and the Russian space program. He joins us today. It's a mix of both. Space uh, remains a, an internal element of the strategic missile defense. So those nuclear armed states uh, are compelled to have space-based capabilities, uh, which provide them with um, capacity for early warning, uh, possible intercept, uh, particularly if we're talking about incoming multiple uh, multiple rocket vehicles, MIRP uh, elements who uh, that pass through the uh, outer space or near near space uh, upon uh, up, uh, prior to descent onto onto designated targets, uh, and 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 certainly in in the future we would certainly be talking about capacity to uh, neutralize somebody else's or adversarial space-based assets to deny them um, uh, the, the usage uh, of space. Uh, equally these days, the, the, the invent of high-precision weaponry is very much associated with um, space-based guidance and, and targeting capabilities without which those high-precision weapons would lose their effectu uh, effectiveness and, and, and accuracy to a considerable degree. So does space pose a weakness to the U.S. arsenal here? You know, without a orbital GPS system network to guide it in, can you actually properly fire a Minuteman missile or a Patriot missile? Not so much the Patriot missile, but I was certainly talking about cruise missiles, whether they're land-based, whether they're air-launched, or whether they're seaborne-launched uh, missiles. Uh, they, um, uh, the the so-called smart bombs. Any missiles with with the guidance, particularly if they are launched from uh, a, a warship or or a combat aircraft, uh, they are more likely to depend on space-based um, uh, surveillance and targeting assets, whether it's GPS or um, Russian version of GLONASS or or European Galileo or or similar system. So that's what gives uh, the leading militaries the edge, uh, and, and, and certainly the, uh, the absence of access or denial of access to space-based assets reduces considerably the accuracy of uh, your expensive munitions, of your expensive weapon systems. But um, I mean, th th these days, um, even, even operations of uh, say special forces or uh, all larger scale conventional formations also very much depend on electronic mapping data that they receive uh, um, with respect to uh, tactical uh, operational um, uh, tactical situational awareness and and again if if if, if the advers if adversarial forces would uh, deny them the opportunity to 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 have access to this electronic data uh, that would certainly curtail the operational timbre of modern modern military unions considerably, simply because everything is 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 getting uh, increasingly digitized um, these days. Uh, plus, we also need to remember uh, the use of space for uh, for high speed internet and and as a, again as a form of communication, whether it's for civilian or or um, or military use. One of the most obvious ways for a country to be able to disable another country's satellite is through an anti-satellite missile. Can you take us through what these are and how they work? Look, I mean, it's uh, effectively, there are two types of anti-satellite uh, missiles. One is a ground-launched missile, uh, which is effectively a long-range intercept uh, that would be launched from either a silo or, or, a, or a mobile uh, launcher to, to hit uh, low orbit space based assets, uh, uh, notably satellites, and they may be uh, air, air launched uh, anti satellite missiles carrying either by um, a long range aircraft, whether it's um, F 15, for example, or Russian MiG 31 aircraft. Um, and, and, and the mission there is effectively to deny and agree a use 
effect of uh, certain certain types of orbits in in space given uh, given the velocity and 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 given the the firing range the effective range of, of current missiles they are likely to hit targets at at, at so-called low or orbits something that was within reach even though uh, the incoming uh, new generation of uh, ground launched um, air defense systems such as for example Russian uh, s500 Promete uh, is supposed to be able to engage targets at the altitude of up to 400 kilometers, which obviously in, in increases their uh, their lethality with regards to engaging uh, uh, space-based assets uh, that operate air, uh, at altitudes close to Earth atmosphere. So the way how the satellite uh, satellite killer um, uh, I operates you lo you obviously identify the target you lock, lock satellite onto onto sorry you lo you lock your missile onto the target you you fire the missile and then uh, the explosion uh, that that happens creates uh, first of all a kinetic effect but also um, a, a massive debris that can inflict damage uh, to the satellite um, either derail it from uh, from its current orbit or uh, uh, inflict um, uh, sufficient collateral damage for it to stop being operational, or uh, in an ideal situation, knock it out from uh, from the orbit and and force it to crash. Now, recently, China tested one of these anti-satellite missiles by targeting one of their own satellites, blowing it up and causing thousands of additional pieces of debris, all of which are now orbiting the Earth at seventeen and a half thousand miles per hour. In fact, it's estimated that 25% of all the space debris up there comes from this one explosion. Surely these anti-satellite missiles, even if they only fired at them at a couple of satellites, would create havoc and chaos up in the orbit with so many pieces of debris flying around at that speed. It, it is a dangerous situation simply because since the, 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 the start of the space era, the amount of space junk that currently orbits Earth uh, has grown exponentially, and every space-based object is uh, uh, is a danger to operational assets that countries launch into into space. Whether we're talking about satellites or or space stations, and 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 certainly when when you um, intercept satellite and and force the satellite to explode as a result of uh, of a kill. Uh, it, multi uh, it, it creates a force multiplier effect. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the, the physics of, of the explosion in orbit can, can create some, some problems for, uh, for uh, the orbits, operational orbits of not only the target satellite, but perhaps whatever is nearby, depending on the, on the size of the explosion. Sec secondly, the debris that uh, the, the, the kill creates um, certainly further pollutes uh, uh, certainly, further pollutes operational orbits, and and orbits in, in in space are not endless. There are a relatively limited number of orbits of various altitudes, um, which can be utilized for um, for the operations of space-based assets. So, uh, an an uncontrolled explosion in space can effectively send debris in in a variety of ways. They can effectively hit operational satellites, um, uh, penetrate their, their shields, because obviously we're not talking about some sort of futuristic force shield. Um, satellite space stations are fairly delicate and fairly susceptible to uh, external as, as well as internal uh, pressures and, and can be damaged in, in, in a variety of ways. And, and um, uh, it may, I mean, explosions in space can also uh, uh, cause some problems with communications. Um, uh, but certainly it, it, it can create the problem when, for example, an orbit can be lost for some time. And if the explosion is really significant and, and serious, it can knock out not only the s satellite you would be targeting, but um, other, other satellites. So in a sense, it can paralyze operations uh, of more than one space space operator if, if you're really making an effort and trying to deny the use of space to to your competitors and and that also triggered uh, the discussion 
uh, at the times of the Cold War when both the Soviet Union and, and the United States were entertaining the idea of um, detonating nuclear devices in space. And in fact, there were a couple of nuclear tests that were carried out in the near Earth atmosphere. And that, first of all, created uh, in immediate uh, environmental impact uh, by damaging the ozone layer, but certainly it, it, it raised uh, both uh, uh, space force awareness of uh, what sort of real damage an unconventional device can cause in, in space. So they quickly realized that if they want to continue to, to operate in, in space, they should restrain the use of offensive military power in space just for the sake of not just denying the use of space to your adversary, but also ensuring that you can continue to use space and you're not going to effectively kill your own uh, space program by trying to test something really, uh, really massive or, or fancy in, in space. Is there any actual way to clean up all this space debris? Or is it simply too hard to catch these thousands of pieces of metal all flying at frankly immense speeds? Look, I mean, as far as far as my understanding is concerned, I don't think we have a technology that would allow us to go and clean uh, this this debris because they're not just hanging out there; they're circling and they're circling at pretty high speeds. So it's not just a matter of going and try to catch the catch them the way how you would catch butterflies. Plus, the sheer cost of such operation. Um, uh, I would imagine if even uh, a technology would be developed, the, the, the sheer cost of the development and the de deployment and operation of such technology would, would, be, would be considerable and whether the, the cost of investing into something like that would have set, um, um, would have set uh, the, the chances of not having any recovery from, from the investment. Uh, I think it's still something debatable. So one of the most effective ways how to uh, get rid of um, space junk is to ensure that it ends up being burned in, 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 in the Earth atmosphere. And if uh, there are pieces that would not be consumed by the flames uh, when they would be, uh, would be uh, entering the Earth atmosphere, then they can be sank at the bottom of the ocean, which is also not ideal because you're talking about space debris that may be carrying toxic fuels that uh, get to the bottom of the ocean and in time corrosion will eat them up and certainly whatever is left on board uh, those spacecraft may may eventually be spilled in, in into the ocean. But currently I think the, the humanity hasn't developed uh, that sort of capability that would allow to engage in a massive cleanup in space. But um, currently we're trying to mitigate it. And I know that spray, space tracking facilities across the globe spend a lot of time when you're touring space junk. So any, or, uh, any object that is flying into space, whether it's controllably or uncontrollably, gets a serial number, gets recorded in, in the, in the, in the files uh, or in the database of space-based assets and all of that is controlled uh, when uh, uh, you uh, uh, monitor your own activities in space, when you monitor somebody else's activities in space, where you effectively participate in, in space launches, where you are responsible for flying your, your space station. Uh, but um, the problem of space junk is not just about the pollution of, of the atmosphere and the pollution of space routes of communications, if you want to call them that. It also adds to the complexity of monitoring adversarial activities in space because uh, proliferation of space junk on one hand poses challenges to the user or the enabler of space. On the other hand, allows them to uh, uh, or create attempts to hide behind space junk uh, to ensure that their satellites or their space-based activities uh, remain undetected. And that, I'm not saying this is an established practice, but this is something perhaps space powers may be exploring in not so uh, distant future as a form of space tactic. We're going to talk a little bit about nuclear weapons in space a bit later, but for now, can you take us through kinetic weapons, how they work and who's using them? 
Well, there's been a lot of um, speculation that during the Cold War, um, for example, the Soviets deployed uh, satellites that carried uh, nuclear nuclear armed munitions uh, that were targeting assets of, of uh, the Soviet adversaries on, on the face of the planet. Um, uh, if, if we're talking about unclassified uh, data that hasn't been substantiated in one way or another, but uh, what, what I'm aware of that certainly during the, the Cold, uh, Cold War years, the Soviets, for example, have developed um, uh, kinetic uh, systems that they have deployed on board their um, uh, combat space stations, for example, uh, the Soviet dedicated military space station called the Almas, uh, meaning the diamond, uh, carried a space gun uh, that was uh, designed to neutralize space-based threats to, to the Soviet satellite station. And um, according to uh, unclassified reports, effectively that space gun operated on what we're now describing new physical principles. So it wasn't necessarily a laser weapon, but it was certainly not something that you would use uh, normally uh, on the battlefield on, on, the, on the face of this planet because obviously space is driven by different laws of physics. Uh, the way how uh, uh, projectiles fly in space is different from the way how they uh, fly in, in the Earth atmosphere. So different type of, uh, uh, different type of munitions, different type of um, uh, offensive weaponry uh, had to be developed in order to uh, uh, be used in space. I know that um, uh, the Soviets also worked on, on space guns, uh, portable devices carried out by the Soviet cosmonauts, military cosmonauts, and they took shape of, of effectively laser, laser pistols. Uh, but that's more of exotic prototypes that weren't really uh, that were tested, but ne never really had a, be, uh, had an opportunity to be combat proven. Uh, uh, another form of offensive weaponry that uh, was documented to be recorded uh, to be deployed in space was satellite killers, special satellites um, that were often uh, carried names of so-called inspectors, uh, whose whole mission was to sit on orbit. And be ready to be to smash themselves into uh, any satellites with an attempt to knock them down from from the orbit. So, conventional forms of weapons would prove to be either ineffective or of very limited effectiveness in in space and uh, and and to operate in space to uh, to consider uh, not just militarization of space but weaponization of space. You really need to talk about uh, weapons based on new physical principles, which make them user friendly in that particular uh, set of physical circumstances. So we would still be talking about perhaps beam weapons or or, or laser weapons uh, or some sort of pulse weapons, or as I said, you know something as crude. Uh, and 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 um, and um, straightforward kinetic as effect effectively sacrificing your purposefully built satellites in order to damage or destroy your enemy satellites. So, uh, kamikaze satellites. What about kinetic weapons we use against targets on Earth? Dropping something like a long metal rod from space until it gains so much kinetic energy from falling and it causes a large explosion when it hits the ground. Are there these kinetic weapons in operation at the moment? And what are the rules of engagement between nations when it comes to this kind of warfare? Look, I mean, this is a very important question because so far there hasn't been any clearly established rules of engagement in space. What is going to happen if your uh, satellite is being uh, knocked down by, uh, by your political adversary with which you are not in the state of the war? I, are you going to apply the same sort of principles of uh, undeclared warfare as, as we have with respect to cyber warfare when states do come under systematic cyber attacks carried out either by state-sponsored agents or, or, or states, uh, state uh, agents, uh, but that doesn't really lead to an open confrontation? Or the value of your uh, 
space-based uh, asset is so much then an attack on it, an attempt to capture it would be declared a violation of your sovereignty and, and you would then be compelled to respond. These questions were, were raised during the Cold War, uh, particularly in, in the second stage of the Cold War when both the United States and the Soviet Union began progressing with their advancement capabilities. For example, the development of the shuttle NAFSTA space-based program uh, and, and um, uh, the Soviet equivalent called the Buran, uh, in theory allowed both the United States and, and the Soviet Union, first of all, to deliver significant payloads onto orbits by means of space shuttles. But also in theory, these uh, space shuttles could have been used uh, to capture enemy satellites, even the size of small um, space stations. So what would you do if an enemy shuttle would approach your space station and was trying to effectively extract it, extract it from the orbit, bring it down to Earth, and, 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 and by that gain access to your uh, highly sensitive um, technology that you would use to develop and deploy your space-based asset. That would obviously give uh, your political adversary not only a competitive edge by effectively having access to your highly sensitive technology, but also a political edge by demonstrating who is the ruler of space. Um, so, um, in, 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 I, I don't think to date would, there is a universal agreement on what to do and more importantly what not to do in space apart from um, a, an agreement reached by the United States and then the former successor, predecessor of, of Russia, the Soviet Union, on um, uh, prohibition of nuclear testing in space. Um, but with regards to first strike capability, well, it's, it's a matter for, for individual nations to determine whether the first strike in space would not lead to an escalation of, um, of tensions and, and an opening of hostilities um, down on, on Earth because um, the, the militarization of space uh, right from the start was directly linked to uh, strategic nuclear uh, uh, deterrent of both the superpowers uh, um, of, of, of that time, the United States and the Soviet Union, and, and these days, it's still very much linked uh, with respect to major military powers to their strategic nuclear deterrence. So if you execute an offensive military operation in space, would this be regarded as a form of unconventional attack uh, uh, or equivalent of it uh, to an unconventional attack on the face of this planet? And then the, 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 the victim of this attack would be compelled to respond. And how this victim is going to respond? by? Uh, a symmetric response by trying to hit another space-based asset of your adversary, or they will try to uh, come up with an alternative response by escalating the situation on the ground or by hitting uh, adversary by means of, for example, a large-scale um, cyber offensive campaign or by other means. So in the absence of clear rules of engagement, it's really hard to, first of all, predict the state behavior, but also determine what the state can, can actually do. I, I think that we, we can assume that both the United States and, and Russia have at least retained some of the offensive capabilities they have developed for themselves during the Cold War days, or certainly can reactivate unless they have already done so of these capabilities in support of their current operations, including the deterrent operations against, against one another. Uh, but to be to be more precise about what the state can do, well, it's a bit hard to say. Speaking of Russia's, for example, a new line of uh, space-based capabilities that were revealed or declassified in some form in in recent years. I mentioned the incoming uh, uh, strategic level uh, uh, surface-to-air missile uh, system S-500 Prometheus. Uh, but a few years ago, Russia revealed uh, that it is now it, it has now deployed a, a new line of its combat lasers called Perisvet, and these laser systems, uh, uh, which were initial the development of which was initially announced by Russia's President Vladimir Putin back in 2018, 
effectively designed to, uh, according to unclassified reports, neutralize in brackets uh, the operations of enemy reconnaissance satellites because these um, uh, 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 ground-based laser systems uh, are supposed to provide uh, some sort of a shield to Russian mobile um, uh, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles launches. So whenever these uh, mi uh, mobile missile systems are on deployment, they constantly uh, get tracked by U.S. and, uh, and other, um, uh, other foreign satellites. And effectively, the purpose of this Parasvet uh, uh, laser system is to blind enemy satellites or perhaps uh, inflict more serious damage uh, to them in order for them to um, uh, to not be able to carry out with their reconnaissance and, and intelligence gathering operations. So that's that's a demonstration of what the Russians can do from the face of this planet, either intercept satellites by means of deploying new line of uh, strategic uh, um, airspace defense, which now extends into near space, or by effectively deploying uh, uh, deploying lasers. The space race is once a game just between the US and the USSR, with space being prohibitively expensive for most nations. These days though, the space field is wide open, with everyone from Iran to India to the EU all getting involved in this new theatre. What does it mean for geopolitics? What will the new geopolitical race in low Earth orbit mean for the geopolitics here on the ground? Well, to talk more about that, we turn to our final guest. Part 3 Death from above. Uh, I would characterize the geopolitics of space today as one that's undergoing uh, immense transition with uh, numerous actors, both at the state level, uh, at the commercial level, and probably in the next few years, we're probably going to see increasingly non-state actor use of space as well uh, in the political sphere. Uh, so everything's to play for. Um, and... Uh, especially in the West, I would argue, uh, not enough politicians are taking it as seriously as they should. John B. Sheldon is a senior advisor to the Space Policy Unit at the Policy Exchange Think Tank in London, as well as the former professor of space and cybersecurity at the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. John has worked with various governments from all across the spectrum, advising on space security. He joins us today. Yeah, I mean, in a number of ways, uh, if you live in a highly developed society, which isn't just the West these days, it's pretty much all over the world in many countries. I, I live in the United Arab Emirates, that's one of them. Uh, pretty much all infrastructure, uh, you know, economic infrastructure, civil infrastructure, as well as the, uh, the methods that we prefer to wage war with, are all dependent upon space system satellites. So communication satellites, navigation satellites, Earth observation, uh, and so on. And uh, as a result of that, space has become a new domain uh, of warfare as well as also geopolitics. Uh, uh, so you now have land, sea, air, cyberspace, and space. Uh, and as a result of that, our preferred way of warfare, our uh, standard of living all depend upon space systems. These are systems that need to be protected. Um, and if we, God forbid, ever go into a war with another major developed society, uh, the strategic imperative will be to deny them access to their space systems in order to try and bring around uh, their, their, their military demands. In general, between countries, how is space movement seen? Do the same rules of Freedom and navigation that we use for international waters also apply to space, or are things governed differently up there? Uh, that's an interesting question because, I mean, the, the, uh, but the maritime analogy only goes so far. Uh, at the moment, uh, thanks to uh, legal custom uh, that's enshrined in the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, any state with a satellite in orbit can overpass any other country due to orbital dynamics without any interference. But I would argue that that is an assumption that has yet to be fully tested in a time of war crisis. Uh, and there are several countries... Uh, both in the past, but also I would argue today, where that that 
that assumption that custom is not as assured as maybe many would uh, like to think. So in the 1970s, for example, a lot of equatorial countries, uh, Colombia, Indonesia, uh, others, formed a, uh, an informal international grouping where they tried to exert their state sovereignty way up above Earth's uh, atmosphere, right out to 36,000 kilometers altitude, which is where you know, geostationary orbit is, where most communication satellites reside. In other words, uh, they were trying to assert their sovereignty over anybody who had a satellite in geostationary orbit uh, over their territory. Now, in the end, the rest of the international community, as well as the uh, international legal community, pretty much rejected that notion, but uh, it didn't die easily. When you look at some of the more informal writings in countries like China, for example, especially among the People's Liberation Army, and I should caveat this by saying this is not a unanimous opinion, but it's uh, a strain of opinion that persists in a lot of PLA writings about space. Uh, where there is an assumption that in a time of war, sovereignty can be extended beyond the Earth's atmosphere into space, and that therefore any enemy satellite or any undesirable satellite that, for example, uh, would pass over China during a time of war is fair game. Before we get into state actors here, I want to talk a little bit first about the private companies here in space. We're seeing guys like Tesla, SpaceX, and others come into this field. And if they were to cause massive damage or attack another satellite, who would get the blame for that? Is there any precedent set for how companies should act in space? Yeah, that's an interesting question. And again, yeah, there's a lot of legal, there's a lot of legal uh, verbiage about these issues. But again, I would argue that in extremists, they're yet to be tested in an actual court of law and in, you know, in the in the real world events. Uh, so all, all companies in space, you know, as a corporate entity, they're registered in one country or another, and they're therefore subject to the laws of that country where they're registered. So, for example, SpaceX is an American registered company, is therefore subject to U.S. laws governing its activities in space. Uh, if SpaceX, as I understand it, and, you know, I could be wrong here because I'm not a space lawyer, thank goodness. Uh, but as I understand it, if uh, in a... In a Twitter rage, for example, Elon decides that he's going to attack, I don't know, something owned by Jeff Bezos in orbit uh, using a SpaceX capability, um, you know, then uh, that would be basically sorted out in a court of law uh, in the United States uh, and no doubt probably on social media. <laughs> but, uh, but let's say there was an international rival to uh, an American company um, a Chinese or a Russian entity, for example, and uh, the American company. And again, I'm thinking, I'm speaking hypothetically here. It doesn't have to be an American company, but let's say that company attacks that Chinese or Russian capability. Um, so, taking aside the fact that you know, if it happened during a time of acute political crisis between the United States and said country, but let's say it doesn't, uh, then that country, its government would then go to the United States, you know, file a diplomatic protest, and there would likely be an international legal wrangle over liabilities and and so forth. Uh, and of course, there's nothing stopping uh, the country that's under attack or the company that's under attack from suing the American company in the American courts as well as the courts of their own country as well. Uh, so as I see it, that's that's how it would happen. I mean, uh, it's an unlikely scenario, obviously, uh, but then as orbits become more congested, when we're talking about uh, the coming era of mega constellations, not just SpaceX, but OneWeb, uh, Jeff Bezos is trying to, uh, well, Amazon, I should I say more accurately, is trying to create uh, uh, Project Kuiper. Uh, the Chinese, uh, the Japanese, the Koreans, South Koreans, are all looking at building their own mega constellations as well. We're going to have a lot of satellites up in orbit, so commercial satellites. Um, and, you know, the, the prospect of things literally smashing into each other increases exponentially. Um, that also you know, would obviously lead to scenarios where there's a lot of misperception, misunderstandings, um, especially because we have imperfect space situational awareness. Uh, so, you know, attributing who smashed into who, who may be at fault or not at fault is going to be uh, very difficult, assuming we don't improve our SSA capabilities. Um, then, yes, you can see how what should be a commercial dispute or an unfortunate you know, orbital accident could turn into something more than that. 
Uh, and uh, I think policymakers are beginning to grapple with this. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's a lot more that needs to be done, both by governments, but also among companies themselves. The private sector is also talking quite a lot about asteroid mining at the moment, which, when it becomes profitable, will likely drive many more players, both governmental and private, into the space theatre. Do you think asteroid mining is right around the corner or still a while away? Well, I say ne- I, I'm, I'm one to uh, never say never, but uh, the... Uh... Uh, I just find the whole uh, prospect of space resource extraction right now, where we stand, uh, to be uh, maybe not as imminent as its uh, uh, advocates would like us to believe. Um, I, I fully expect in the next few decades that someone may well do it um, and good on them. Um, so I'm not dismissive of the notion. I'm just skeptical that we're going to be doing it anytime soon. Uh, but that said, you know, uh, there are a lot of people, uh, serious people who are interested in this issue. Um, they're looking at it in a very uh, serious and systematic way, including, I should add, some of the energy uh, uh, companies here in this region. Um, and the reason why they're looking at it is because while it may not necessarily be technologically and commercially feasible today, you still need the long lead times uh, to plan and uh, organize accordingly in order to be able to do it when it is technologically and commercially uh, feasible. So, um, you know, it's watch this space, I would argue. But uh, I'm, uh, you know, there's a, I think it was Bill Gates of Microsoft fame who, uh, who said that uh, we always overestimate what we can do within two years, but underestimate what can be done in 10. Um, and I think that uh, certainly applies to uh, anybody looking at uh, doing space mining. To sort of bring it back to nation states here, we've seen quite a big buildup of offensive weapons in space from the Chinese, the Russians and the Americans. But what about the Europeans? How are the Europeans approaching the question of space? Uh, as an as a entity such as the European Commission slash European Union or NATO, no. Individual European countries, uh, yes. And, but then again, it's not uniform. Uh, for example, uh, Florence Pali, the uh, Minister of the Armed Forces in France, uh, has basically uh, certainly spoken about uh, France possibly pursuing some sort of defensive space weapon capability to protect their satellites. Uh, given that France is one of the countries where allegedly uh, Russian inspection satellites have come uh, far too close for comfort to uh, French national security satellites. Uh, so uh, France is certainly looking at it. Um, you know, that's the only country that's explicitly spoken about it. But uh, I would imagine that in most uh, uh, European countries, certainly at the def- defence planning level, um, it's being looked at, even if there isn't necessarily any established policy or uh, program in place. Uh, so uh, I would argue, by the way, that uh, in any policymaker looking at these fields, uh, uh, the best policy to follow, if you're not sure, is to basically have no policy. You don't want to box yourself into a corner one way or another. Uh, so, but uh, the uh, but at the European, you know, uh, supranational level, as in the European Union, uh, there is certainly no policy or thinking on this issue. And at the NATO level, anything offensive, not just space, but for example, in cyber as well, that's too hot to handle. Uh, uh, Offensive matters are left to individual states. And so the emphasis will be on all defensive, passive defensive measures. What about Russia then? How has Russia's space doctrine changed over the last 30 years, particularly when it comes to their surveillance capabilities? It's the most aggressive space country in terms of the everyday headline kind of activities they get up to. But I think if you were to discern an actual serious uh, strategic or or more importantly military doctrine here, uh, what they're basically trying to do is demonstrate their ability to deny space to anybody uh, that would come up against them in a conventional military conflict. Um, And so, you know, for the Russians, it won't be necessarily about taking over space during a conflict. It will be about denying NATO forces or any other person, sorry, a country that would uh, uh, look to be in conflict with them. So it's all about space denial from the Russian perspective. And the surveillance capabilities? Yeah, that's where things get problematic for the Russians. Uh, 
Yeah, it, it's it's a it's a truism here, but uh, within the space community, the Russians are very highly regarded and have an excellent reputation when it comes to space launch. Their their uh, their launch vehicles are uh, you know highly reliable, uh, uh, relatively cheap. Uh, they're not necessarily always pretty or environmentally friendly, but they get the job done in, in a very reliable manner, by and large. When it comes to their satellites, unfortunately, it's not uh, necessarily the case. Uh, uh, and this is uh, an issue across the entire Russian defense industry, as far as we can tell, uh, which is basically reliability of parts, uh, access to uh, uh, you know, highly uh, uh, advanced uh, microelectronics, uh, you know, things like semiconductors, all these sort of things. And then also there's a malaise within the industrial base itself where, you know, there's a lot of sloppy workmanship, uh, mostly because, you know, there's a lot of uh, poor wages, even if they get paid on time, um, and uh, a massive morale problem. And uh, the Russians themselves realize this and are trying to address it. But, uh, and just as importantly, by the way, within the Russian defense industry, as well as the space industrial base, is chronic corruption, uh, which is always undermining their efforts. Uh, it's not because of a lack of Russian intelligence or ambition. Uh, you know, their engineers and scientists are among the best in the world. They're very highly regarded as professionals. Uh, but the, the system, the structure in place to make it all happen just isn't up to par. As a result, their satellites are just not as effective as any satellites used in the West. And what about the Chinese? Are they catching up to the Americans in their space program? Uh, there is an ambition to catch up, but... Uh, I think uh, if we rely just on uh, you know, historical headlines, uh, we would be misinterpreting what's really going on here. Uh, the United States is by far and away the most advanced space power on this planet and has been for quite some time and likely will be at least for the next decade. Uh, so um, I don't think there's time yet to panic. Uh, if I was an American policymaker, but there's certainly not a time to be complacent either. But the United States is still the only country to have put humans on the moon and then safely return them to planet Earth. Um, it has by far the most advanced space capabilities on the planet, uh, both in terms of commercial, but also civil as well as military. Um, it has by far the world's largest space budgets in terms of civil space budget, its military space budget, its black space budgets, its commercial space budgets, uh, and so on. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's a colossus. Uh, but of course, colossus can, you know, ha have Achilles heels, they can trip over if they're not careful. Um, and I would argue at the moment, the biggest danger to American space power and its standing in the world doesn't necessarily emanate from the likes of the Chinese or the Russians, but it does emanate from uh, self-inflected uh, missteps on the part of American policymakers. Um, so you know, that's in terms of maybe not necessarily uh, allocating enough budget to meet uh, declared political ambitions in space. Uh, that could be, for example, uh, trying to uh, put in autarky, uh, autarkical-like policies regarding data sharing and access to technologies. Uh, I read uh, the other week that the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office uh, is basically going to uh, impose a form of shutter control over all commercial companies that provide them uh, Earth observation capabilities. Uh, the result of this, of course, will mean that uh, foreign countries will think twice about using said American commercial Earth observation capabilities if they find that in a global emergency, their uh, access to that imagery is going to be immediately turned off by the US government. Um, this in turn leads to even allied countries uh, to develop their own high uh, uh, resolution imaging capabilities uh, that of course in turn makes us policymakers more nervous so it becomes this vicious uh, self-imposed uh, cycle um, so a more uh, strategic view of how america can assure access to commercial imagery needs to be taken and and i would argue these days we probably have to be taken in consultation with, with its closest allies not just by itself well, with the Americans being so guarded when it comes to anything to do with space, if the chips were to go down and war were to break out, would the Americans be willing to then share this technology with their allies or would it maintain a level of secrecy when it comes to space? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I uh, despite my accent, I actually used to work for the US Air Force, uh, you know, some years ago. Um, and when I worked for the US Air Force, and I'm a UK citizen, um, 
but uh, it was uh, the situation then uh, was far worse than it is today in the sense that uh, everything was behind the green door, even things that were frankly common knowledge in public. Um, nothing could be shared even within the Air Force itself or to other services. Um, there were stories about in their operation centers, for example, the commanding general telling uh, the three letter agency types who asked him to clear the floor before they could tell him what they had to offer, being told to uh, get out, but using far more uh, effective language in that sense. Uh, now we're looking at the uh, uh, US military space establishment that's far more open, uh, far more ready to share both among its sister services um, but also among its closest allies as well. And uh, that includes obviously the Five Eyes, uh, UK, US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand. Um, and we now have a uh, combined space operations center uh, structure in place where all five countries uh, contribute to uh, coordinating space operations. Um, we uh, also, of course, you know, uh, in the headlines very much today, the, uh, the AUKUS agreement between Australia, UK and the US uh, that's focused right now on nuclear propulsion for Australian submarines, uh, but uh, also includes apparently, allegedly, uh, greater Australian access to some of the uh, high-end capabilities offered by the US National Reconnaissance Office, so in other words, spy satellites. Uh, and uh, so, you know, there's always been that aspect for several years now where the Five Eyes especially are very much involved in sharing as much data as possible with each other, coordinating operations, a lot of transparency with each other, um, a lot of regular consultation at leadership levels and so forth. Uh, but uh, we're now also looking at uh, the inclusion of the likes of Japan, South Korea, France, Germany, um, you know, Italy, Norway, Brazil, um, several other, you know, friendly and allied countries to the United States also bring brought into that circle, not necessarily as closely as the Five Eyes, uh, but certainly in a, in a sense where there's a lot more effective coordination, uh, harmonization, understanding, um, and, you know, much needed sharing of capability and capacity. So it's, it's going in the right direction. We've spoken today about satellite on satellite weapons, like kamikaze satellites that smash into other ones or robot arms attached to satellites that can pull other satellites off course. But are there any countermeasures to these? Is there any way for satellites to actually defend themselves? Yeah, space situational awareness. Um, and, uh, and by that, I mean not just uh, you know, really cool telescopes and radars on the ground, uh, and we need more of them, uh, but also space situational awareness based in space itself. So in other words, cameras on satellites, other sensors that can uh, detect what's going on. That increases transparency, which is paradoxical for a lot of people in the national security business because, you know, transparency can cut both ways. Uh, but, uh, you know, the moment you see a Russian or Chinese satellite coming a bit too close for comfort uh, to one of your satellites, you can make it public. You can say, hey, we know what you're doing. Uh, we have the evidence. Um, yeah, and couple of that with some both passive and maybe in, in some cases more assertive uh, defensive measures, um, then uh, you, know, you can soon establish at least a, a baseline of tactical deterrence uh, that would change the game. But here's, here's the problem. I mean, every time we find a solution to a current problem in space warfare, um, it doesn't necessarily change the strategic calculus whereby you know, uh, rivals and adversaries are looking to both dominate and deny it to each other. But what about launching MIRVs from space? In the context here, MIRVs being nuclear warheads that break apart into 10 little warheads or so and then hit multiple targets with nuclear explosions. These being up in space would mean that they would be able to fire these from space directly above and hit their targets in 90 seconds rather than the 30-ish minutes it takes an ICBM to travel from Russia to the US. Are players in space using these MIRVs to have a capability of launching a sort of nuclear Pearl Harbor if need be? We already have MIRVs in space, you know, so if you're, especially the Russia and China and the United Kingdom, um, we have MIRVs in space already. We've had them since at least the 1970s. Do you think the introduction of something like the US Space Force is ratcheting up even more militarization of space? What impact do you think that Space Force will have on this theater? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a classic chicken and egg story here in terms of, uh, you know, and it depends on where, you know, the, where you sit, you know, how you see the world, I guess. But, uh, um, 
given my you know affiliate previous affiliation with the Air Force and you know, my deep involvement in national security space issues over the years, I can tell you that uh, the idea of an independent space force has been, at least as an idea, doing the rounds within the US Air Force since at least the early 1980s. Um, so this didn't appear out of nowhere, uh, as, as far as the uh, military services are concerned, at least anyway. Um, but, you know, there are those who argue, well, now that we have the Space Force, that's it. You know, it's going to spur other countries to, you know, do X, Y, and Z, and it's all going to be bad, and, you know, uh, and so on. Um, and then there's the school of thought, which I which I subscribe to, which is basically, you know, Space Force was a reaction to a worsening situation. Um, and, uh, you know, since at least, uh, you know, I would argue since at least 2008, 2009, the security situation in space has been deteriorating. Um, and uh, mostly because uh, Russian and Chinese defense planners recognize that in the event that they were to come up against uh, the United States in a military conflict, uh, U.S. space superiority in terms of its ability to access satellites and uh, utilize those satellites for superior conventional military force was going to be a problem. And therefore, their strategic dilemma is how do we deny the United States its access to space systems? And as a result, they've been developing various counter space measures and other operational concepts to do that. This, of course, has been noticed by the United States. Uh, you know, has been rather alarmed by this uh, because you know we're now looking at you know near peer adversaries looking to literally deny the United States' preferred way of warfare, um, and as a result, you know. The United States is taking countermeasures. One of those countermeasures, I would argue, uh, was the emergence of Space Force. Um, and of course, unfortunately, it got uh, all mixed up in the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, rather hair-raising politics at the time under the Trump administration. Um, but underneath the political theater and, and bombast and, frankly, clownish behavior at one level, there was a serious uh, uh, strategic rationale here. Should we be viewing these space programs as the next Pearl Harbor, a first strike weapon, or more akin to a advanced surveillance unit? We're always looking for the silver bullet that's going to, you know, make sure it's all over. If not by tomorrow, then certainly by Christmas or Ramadan or you know, Golden Week, whatever your preferred, you know, national religious holiday is. Uh, where in actual fact, uh, historically, war and warfare has always been about attrition and space will be no different. Um, and uh, the uh, now how it's carried out, how that attrition is carried out is going to be, you know, based on the technologies and doctrines and operational concepts of the day, not of the 1940s. Um, and uh, you know, so how that looks in detail, of course, is going to be anyone's guess. Uh, but uh, I don't see, I don't foresee a Pearl Harbor-like collapse of, you know, an entire network of, uh, you know, constellations of satellites and boom, the whole thing is over from one side to the other. Uh, certainly that doesn't stop countries from planning for that kind of assumption. You know, it's been alleged that's how the Chinese are planning. Uh, the Chinese may be in for a surprise. At the same time, you know, Western planners may also be in for a surprise. Uh, but I can't see the system collapsing overnight or within a matter of hours. Um, you know, the, the whole thing, certainly from a Western perspective, take GPS, for example, the whole thing is designed to degrade gracefully over a period of time. Uh, no, what, what will end everything will be, of course, uh, a nuclear conflagration. Um, and that's a different discussion altogether. But, uh, you know, uh, take out enough of the GPS... Uh, system, for example, would certainly be a data point for American strategists to think, are we on a nuclear ladder? Um, fortunately, taking out GPS as designed, at least enough of it, is extremely difficult. I remember someone once describing war in space to me as all hammer and no shield. As this new theater gives people the power to be able to nuke 10 American cities in 90 seconds, drop kinetic weapons that exert the power of tons of TNT, black out entire banking and communication systems, and blind your enemy's main sources of valence in the 20th century. That hammer is very heavy, but the wielder is also very undefended, and the repercussions are disastrous, and there are very few ways to defend yourself up there. With one, just one, anti-satellite missile 
China created 25% of the space debris up there. Thousands of bullet-like projectiles traveling around the Earth at amazing speeds. Our satellites and space stations need to be lightweight, so they aren't made of solid 6-inch thick steel. Even just one bit of shrapnel can rip right through a satellite, and then create even more forever spinning deadly debris. Granted that a war in space may not kill as many people as a nuclear exchange, but even just a few of those satellites exploding can create debris that destroys even more satellites, which creates debris and that destroys even more satellites, and on and on and on. What that means for humanity is that any future traveling out to space will be like trying to walk through a tornado full of live bullets. And because of the physics up there, even our future generations that are heading to the outer parts of the solar system would still have to contend with this issue. So what lies ahead? Will it simply just be another mutually assured destruction up in orbit between the major nations? Or will one side see an advantage and realize that taking out the other's communication may allow them enough time to coordinate a knockout punch before the other can get a punch in? Right now, everything is so shrouded in secrecy when it comes to space, and the boundaries are still yet to be designated properly. But we hope they find a way to not clutter up the skies with debris and deadly shrapnel. Because even now, space is becoming a lot more crowded than it once was. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week, and I apologize for my voice this week. I'm getting ever a bit of a flu on this end. This month period here is actually a pretty special one for us here at the show, as it's the Red Line's two-year anniversary coming up. So to celebrate, we have lots of cool stuff coming up for this frankly insane milestone. So check out our next Geopolitics pub quiz coming up, as well as some behind-the-scenes content that should be online very soon. If you want to check out some of this content for yourself, you can find links to it on our Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Instagram, and Discord on the handle at the Red Line Pod. Or if you want to find me on Twitter, you can find me on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. Or you can always visit our website, www.theredlinepodcast.com. As we began a few episodes ago, as a small token of our appreciation, we're going to be reading out the name of our latest Patreon to sign up as of time recording. So a big thanks goes out to Nicholas J. Myers, who's our latest Patreon. This show would not be possible without the support of amazing Patreons who donate small amounts of money each week to help us keep the show going. Our Patreons who get to join in on games nights and live Q&As and get extra materials as well as hang out with me one-on-one are all incredibly appreciated. And our donations 100% go back into the program, helping us pay for staff, programs, hosting websites, and lawyers that are really essential for running a show like this. I cannot thank our current Patreons nearly enough for their support. And if you feel like you could spare a couple of dollars a week, we'd greatly appreciate it. But for now, this episode, all about space, is dedicated to you, Nick. So thank you. As usual, here are our three book recommendations if you want to take this subject further. The first is The War in Space by Bled and Bowen, all about the complex issue that is orbital warfare. The second is Understanding Space Strategy by John J. Klein, for some of the finer details on this new theater of war. And the third is The Next Hundred Years by a friend of the show, George Friedman, to which a good chunk of the book spends talking about the future projections for space warfare. I want to thank all of our guests this week, Bledim Bowen, Alexei Moraviov, and John B. Sheldon. All of you were absolutely fantastic to work with on this one, and we really look forward to having you back on the show soon. I also want to thank my staff, Owen Swift, the producer, Perry Grace and Daniela Zavella, the research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, and Nick Much, our field correspondent. All of you are absolutely amazing to work with, and you have made this show what it is. There is no way we would have made it to two years without you guys. The last thanks goes out to you for tuning into the show. Again, it's been two years, 52 episodes. We haven't missed a single fortnight that entire time. And so many of you have listened to almost every single episode, and that just really really warms my heart i cannot thank each and every one of you who has been here from for some of you the very beginning of this journey i had no idea this show would reach anywhere near the amount it has and it's been completely thanks to people like yourself 
who've tuned into the show and recommended us. So from the bottom of my heart and the rest of the team, thank you so much. The show will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Redline podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.